you, Penny, and uh, welcome everybody to the second half of the session entitled Partnership in Innovation. Now, when I've seen the title Partnership in Innovation, it was absolutely clear to me that this means that innovation could, should come in equal parts from those that present and from those that sit in the audience. That's the meaning of partnerships. And listening to some of the questions yesterday and today, you certainly rise up to the occasion. So one thing I was thinking about is maybe to allocate to some of you a Bessie Lawrence Fellowship so you can come to the Weizmann Institute, spend the time in the lab and test and test your ideas. Now, uh, the common theme of uh, the four scientists that present today is the fact that they are all representative of the young generation of Weizmann scientists. And Israel Bar Joseph uh, explained uh, the way we, the, the, our philosophy and, and the way we select, the difficulties we face, and the challenges we have to bring in these excellent young people to the Weizmann Institute. And I'll just add uh, three short things. The first one is, uh, can be summarized in the sentence, it's all about people. We care much more about the quality of the people that we interviewed for a faculty position than in, on their exact research program. In other words, we are not interested uh, in the front runner because this is a front runner in a uh, 10,000 meter dash. We are interested in the front runners in every athletic uh, uh, field. And we never tell these people what to do and what to specialize in. We tell them, you do whatever you want, you follow your dreams. The only thing we ask from you is in whatever you have selected as your field of expertise, you should make a meaningful, significant contribution, and if possible, develop to a world leader. This means that they have to compete with peers that were recruited in the best universities uh, in the US and Western Europe, and this is something you cannot do without providing them with the uh, funds and facilities that are comparable to those recruited by leading uh, universities. There is absolutely no point to bring in the sharpest mind without providing them the means to fully exploit uh, their potentials, to fully execute uh, their dreams. And that's exactly where I'm particularly grateful the people that sit in the audience, because I often have to write check of one or two million dollars, which is not covered by my Weizmann bank account, in order to bring in this young. So even though I don't have the money, I'm absolutely convinced that somebody will stand up, come through, and will make, us, make, make it possible uh, for us to recruit uh, these young people that, that we really think should be at the Weizmann Institute. And this is, as Israel mentioned, in the last seven years, 30% of the faculty are, uh, are people who were not here seven years ago, and this kind of infusion of fresh blood is absolutely essential to an institute uh, like others. And looking at them, following their research, and even you yourself can see this generation of young scientists is probably much better than the previous generations. And the international standing, and I'm quite sure about it, the international standing of the Weizmann Institute in, let's say, 2020, when these people will take the leading seat, uh, will be much higher and much better than it is today. So, without further ado, I would like to introduce the first of the two speakers in this session, and this is Professor Debbie Fass. Uh, 
Debbie received her PhD in structural biology from MIT in uh, 1997. She did a postdoc at the Whitehead Institute and joined the Weizmann Institute in 1998. Her research focused on understanding enzymes that help the folding and assembly of other proteins inside and outside the cell. In particular, uh, she is interested to study how proteins are being stampled by what is called cross-linking during and after their folding. This sounds very mysterious. I can assure you it would be clear in a moment. She looked at the mechanism and consequences of uh, this protein in all scales from the atom to the whole organism. Debbie, the floor is yours. Uh, so Professor Garty forgot to mention that I'm a sore disappointment to my parents by not getting a PhD and becoming a protein chemist instead. Um, but I'll try not to disappoint you. So uh, the previous two speakers spoke about physiological processes occurring on the level of the entire organism, the whole individual. But I'd like to remind you that every physiological process in our bodies is the result of an intricate and dynamic dance of molecules that's happening on the scale of the nanometer and the angstrom. So an artist's eye into the underpinnings of our physiology might present a picture such as this one, in which each of these colored shapes represents an individual protein molecule. Now, there are about 100,000 different types of proteins in the human body. And with many copies of each type, we can estimate that we contain about 10 to the power of 22 protein molecules within us. Now, to give you a sense of the vastness of this number, it happens to be about the same as the number of total stars in the observable universe, in all the galaxies, in every direction we look as far as it is theoretically possible to see. So in essence, each of us is an entire protein universe. Now, in my work, I don't just count proteins. I try to understand them, how they function, how they interact with one another to make our complex physiologies. Now, the first fact to appreciate about proteins in the search uh, for an understanding of their function is that proteins start off as long ribbons or strings or chains, long molecules. And these protein strings are made by the ribosome according to the instructions given it by our DNA. And it is our very own Adi Onath from the Department of Structural Biology at the Weizmann Institute, recipient of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry, who pioneered the study of the structure of the ribosome and gave us enormous insight into how proteins are born. Now, the second fact to appreciate about proteins is that starting from this linear string, this long string, they fold up into complex, beautiful, and elegant shapes. And it's these shapes and the, the precise positioning of chemical groups within these shapes that allow proteins to carry out their diverse activities in our bodies. And I wasn't expecting to be honored by the presence of uh, Michal Sela here in the audience, but it turns out that he's the pioneer of the study of protein folding, and he inspired me and many other generations of scientists in this field. Now, unfortunately, sometimes things go wrong. And either due to mutations or to failure in the quality control mechanisms for production of proteins in our bodies, proteins can misfold. And this can lead to diseases such as Alzheimer disease, cystic fibrosis, hypercholesterolemia, and many others. Now, I've compared protein folding to origami. But it turns out that these two art forms differ in a few crucial ways. The first one is a bit trivial, that protein folding takes a one-dimensional uh, string and results in a three-dimensional structure, whereas origami starts with a two-dimensional paper and produces a three-dimensional object. The second difference between protein folding and origami is perhaps a bit more interesting, that protein folding is an art without an artist. What does that mean? 
Well, most proteins know how to fold into their complex three-dimensional shapes using only attraction and repulsion between chemical groups within the protein chain itself without requiring any sort of external energy or direction. In other words, proteins spontaneously fold by self-assembly into their three-dimensional shapes, subject to a relatively few and reasonably well-understood forces. And it's the approximation of these forces for computer simulations of proteins that earned Michael Levitt and Arya Warshall the 2013 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for work conducted at the Weizmann Institute under the guidance of the late and sorely missed Schneer Lifson. Now, a final difference between protein folding and origami, which relates in particular to my work, is that whereas an origami artist would never dream of using glue or tape or any other tricks to reinforce his art, uh, protein folding actually has absolutely no problem with stapling. So the, the staples in this case are uh, particular chemical bonds formed between sulfur atoms from distant parts of the protein chain that are linked together either as or after the protein folds into its three-dimensional shape. Now, in biological systems, these sulfur-sulfur bonds, called disulfide bonds, are introduced by dedicated enzymes. Now, the word enzyme is just a generic term for any protein that speeds up a biological process. In my lab, we determine the atomic resolution structures of these disulfide stapling enzymes and try to understand their biochemical mechanisms. So to do this, we zoom into the active sites of these enzymes and describe the chemical and physical principles by which they function. Um, now, just like the stapler that might sit on your uh, desk in the office, um, these disulfide stapling enzymes have moving parts. And because of that, we also study their dynamics, their movement and their flexibility, and try to understand how these movements contribute to their activity. Now, the movie you see here is a graphic artist's representation of one of, the, of one of the disulfide stapling enzymes that we study, but it's based on a great deal of real scientific data. Only the time scale of the motions you see is inaccurate. You can imagine it's sped up about 100 times, but it gives you some sense into the large-scale conformational changes that are involved in this molecular stapling reaction. So now that I've introduced you to the type of enzyme that we study in my laboratory, let me give you an example of what such enzymes are good for. So the enzyme that you saw in the movie is a disulfide stapler that functions in the assembly of the extracellular matrix, which is a dense network of protein fibers that are made by the cells in our bodies and in which the cells are then embedded. Now, scientists are very interested in the structure and assembly of the extracellular matrix because virtually every process relating to health and disease is literally wrapped up in it. So the extracellular matrix gives structure and mechanical strength to the tissues in our bodies, but it's not just a passive scaffold. Instead, it's actively involved in, uh, in cell growth and decisions about cell life and cell death cell differentiation, cell movement, and cell communication. Also, the extracellular matrix has a very important role to play in many diseases, including cancer, fibrosis, and muscular dystrophy. So one goal of my lab was to understand how stapling of disulfide bonds in the extracellular matrix contributes to the normal function of this matrix in development and in tissue stability and also, we asked whether or not we might be able to manipulate the process of disulfide stapling to combat disease. I'd like to emphasize, though, at this point, that my, uh, the primary motivation of my lab was the basic scientific desire to understand protein folding and assembly in the extracellular matrix. We weren't uh, motivated to answer, to address a particular medical problem. But as you can see in the rest, as you'll see in the rest of my presentation, the, uh, the tools that we developed to question, interact with, and manipulate the extracellular matrix ended up giving rise naturally 
um, to uh, potential applications to disease, and I'll describe those to you shortly. Okay, in case this topic of uh, protein folding assembly in the extracellular matrix is starting to sound too esoteric to you, uh, you may be relieved to hear that you actually may know more about the extracellular matrix than you realize. So some of you may have heard of the protein collagen, uh, which is one of the major components of the extracellular matrix. And you may have heard about it because collagen is injected uh, for cosmetic purposes as a filler. For example, to make lips more sexy or to soften the, some of the signs of aging. And uh, just like any other protein, uh, extracellular matrix proteins such as collagen also fold from the flexible fibers, from the flexible strings they start off as, uh, into folded three-dimensional structures. The only difference is that the extracellular matrix proteins tend to fold into more elongated shapes than the typical round globular shapes that you would see for other proteins. Now, once these extracellular matrix proteins like collagen fold up, they then can further self-assemble to make larger fibrils and networks. Okay, just to re-emphasize, the extracellular matrix is a protein infrastructure that's made by cells, and the cells then reside in it and on it. Just like people make uh, the infrastructure of cities, and then we then reside within these networks of transportation and communication. So to appreciate the importance of the extracellular matrix, in uh, tissue organization, all you have to do is think about the havoc that is wreaked by the breakdown of any of the uh, normal infrastructure that we're used to in cities. For example, uh, bridges, garbage collection, um, subways, electricity, internet. So similarly, cells rely on the extracellular matrix to function successfully and coherently as tissues. There is one difference, though, between the picture you see here and the extracellular matrix. And that's that people tend to be much smaller than the structures that we build to link us into societies. Whereas cells tend to be much larger than the fine fibrils that connect them in tissues. And to show you what an extracellular matrix infrastructure really looks like, in this scanning electron microscopy image taken by a particularly talented postdoc in my lab, a bit of extracellular matrix is visible, magnified 150,000 times between the cells that produced it and are now sitting on top, in, on top of it and interacting with it. So each of these large expanses here is part of a big flat cell that is so enormous on this scale that only a very small part of it is visible. Now, uh, there are many, many hundreds of proteins that assemble together to make this extracellular matrix. And to illustrate to you how delicate this filigree folding is, uh, the width of a, of a single human hair, even one as thin as, as mine, would be 100 times the length of this white bar in the upper corner. And as you can see, each of these fibrils here is only a tiny, tiny fraction of the white bar. And in fact, some of the fibers that you see here are only a single protein molecule in thickness. So what my laboratory is trying to do is to understand how disulfide stapling in the assembly of this structure shown here affects the essential properties of the matrix. Now, to aid in our research, we have developed means, we developed tools to interfere with or inhibit the disulfide stapling process in protein folding and assembly. Shown in green here is a molecule that we designed to stick tightly to that disulfide stapler in the extracellular matrix and prevent it from doing its job, just like the green hulk is doing to the stapler in the left. Now, interfering with the function of key molecules in biological systems is both an excellent way to study their physiological roles and also can have, in certain cases, practical applications. So using this inhibitor of the disulfide stapling enzyme in the extracellular matrix, we have seen how the orderly assembly of the fibers in the extracellular matrix is disrupted when disulfide stapling is stopped. So in this slide, I've artificially colored three different proteins that all coexist together within the extracellular matrix, one of them being a protein called fibronectin, another one called laminin, and the third one, collagen, with which you're already familiar. 
Now, if you look carefully and you compare the top row of images to the bottom row, you can see that when we stop our disulfide stapling enzyme with our inhibitor, that the fibronectin network becomes holier, the laminin network uh, becomes spots instead of threads, and the collagen network just looks uh, uh, looser and more disorderly than the properly stapled matrix as shown above. Now, breaking down infrastructure doesn't sound like something someone would want to do. But if we think of times of war or to facilitate rebuilding, then destruction sometimes has its uses. We've observed that the disrupted extracellular matrix, as shown in this bottom row of images, actually doesn't allow cells to stick to it or to move along it as it should. And this may be a hint of how we can control metastatic and fibrotic diseases. So to explore this idea, we did the following experiment. We took a dish and we grew normal cells in the bottom of this dish, which had tiny little holes in it. Now, we let these cells grow and produce their extracellular matrix infrastructure for a few days. But we did that under two different conditions, either normally without bothering them from doing their job, or we added our inhibitor of the disulfide stapling enzyme so that the extracellular matrix made by these cells was defective. Then after a few days, we put in cancer cells, tumor cells, on top of the normal cells and their associated extracellular matrix, either stapled properly or not. And then after another day, we counted how many cells were able to penetrate through that extracellular matrix and escape through the holes on the bottom. And this is a mimic of the process of metastasis of cancer cells in the body. As you can see on the right, these are images of the cells that have escaped through the bottom of this dish after going through the extracellular matrix. And you can see that in the absence of disulfide stapling, that fewer cancer cells were able to make it through the matrix and out the bottom of these holes. Now, if you've been paying attention, that might seem completely counterintuitive to you. Because I've just described to you that when we block disulfide stapling in the extracellular matrix, the matrix looks like it's more full of holes. It looks looser. And you might expect that the cancer cells would be able to penetrate more easily through this loose, disrupted matrix. But perhaps a better way to think about this experiment is that the disulfide bond crosslinks are like ties in a railroad track. And without these ties, the tracks that the cells need to move along in order to, in, in order to escape are broken. So provocatively, this disulfide stapling enzyme that I've been describing to you has recently been seen to be overproduced in many different types of cancers, including breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and pancreatic cancer. And we think it may be there to help the cancer cells make the railroad tracks in the extracellular matrix that they need to move along to metastasize to different sites in the body. Therefore, the immediate goals of my lab are to use that inhibitor of the disulfide stapling enzyme that we've developed to try to prevent metastasis of, of real cancer cells and not just cancer cells in a dish. In addition, following our basic research program, we are currently doing a full molecular mapping of this extracellular matrix infrastructure, trying to identify the initial point of the breakdown that's caused, the functional and physical breakdown that's caused by stopping disulfide stapling. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to the members of my lab uh, who are doing this work, uh, both the, the basic science and the more applied. I won't introduce you to all of them individually. I just wanted to give you a taste of the people behind uh, the scenes here. Um, so uh, all of my uh, group members are Israelis, um, but they come from very, very different backgrounds. And just to give you an example, uh, Yael here comes from a poor town in the south, and she's the first person ever to go to college, much less receive a PhD from her family. Um, Iris's uh, parents are professors at the Technion, but she has the ambition to be a professor at the Weizmann, and she won't take any substitute. <laughs> and, uh, and Toot here is a new student. Uh, Toot means uh, berry in Hebrew, and her parents are farmers, and that's very nice because we get big boxes of fruit every once in a while delivered to our lab. Um, but of course, our, our little lab cell would be completely adrift uh, if we weren't part of this wonderful, wonderful Weizmann matrix. Uh, that's composed of individual research labs, many of which we collaborate with on this and other projects. 
and also all the wonderful service units. Um, I like to think about it this way, that uh, the Weizmann Institute is a, a rich mesh that's composed of uh, an interweaving of the research laboratories and the service units that together make a very, very dense and strong fabric uh, that, brings us, uh, that brings us to our goals. And in particular, I'd like to highlight our use of the uh, proteomics units through the, um, the uh, Personalized Medicine Cent uh, Institute. Um, we make great use of that and uh, of many other services available. And I'd like to thank you uh, with all my heart for providing me um, a wonderful home and workplace in Israel. Um, there's no substitute for the Weizmann Institute.